Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Right. So like I said, uh, analyzing activities, uh, chapter four. Uh, this chapter will be covered in your uh, test. Okay, alongside chapter one, two, and I think chapter three. Uh, together lah. So that will be your test. Test one. Okay. Uh, bila date ni nanti I akan maklumkan kemudian. Alright. So now let's go to the main content, the preview of the chapter. Okay. So this will be the preview of this chapter. Uh, I will start with the brief introduction on the type of assets. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I continue with the components that are available in current assets such as your cash, cash equivalents, uh, receivables, as well as uh, prepaid uh, expenses or prepayments. And then uh, I will continue with the inventories as uh, part of the components in current assets. Okay, then after that, I can sambung pula dengan your long-term asset ataupun property plan and equipment. Okay, uh, which consists of your tangible, uh, intangible asset and as well as uh, natural resources. Okay, right. So you can go to page 227 in your textbook. Okay, sekejap. Ada yang baru nak masuk. I terpaksa go to the way. Sekejap ni. Okay. Okay, now. First of all, uh, if you look at page 227 there, eh, the first paragraph tu. Okay. It stated that assets are resources controlled by a company for the purpose of generating profit then we can classify our assets into two different categories, okay, which are current or short-term asset and non-current or long-term asset. So I believe uh, all of you uh, at this level will be able to define uh, current asset and non-current asset uh, based on your own understandings, okay. So what you can see uh, in your slide is the one that been defined by the authors, by the author. Lah. So I think you have your own definition and how can you classify and differentiate between these two uh, type of assets. Okay, but never mind, we, we can still use the definition by the author. So for example, current assets are resources or claims to resources that are expected to be sold, collected or used within one year or operating cycle, whichever is longer. Whereby for non-current assets, so these are the resources that are expected to yield benefits that extend beyond one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. Okay, so in a normal uh, operating cycle, 12 months, okay, so all those assets that keep on convert between one item to another item will be your current assets and otherwise it will be classified as your non-current assets. And in fact, in the same paragraph there, you can look at the bottom of the paragraph where the author try to classify uh, the, the assets into financial and operating assets. Now, let's go to the definitions there. So, financial assets consist mainly of marketable securities and other investments in non-operating assets. They usually are value at fair or market value and are expected to yield returns equal to their risk adjusted cost of capital. So, we need to see financial assets more on financial instrument such as investment or short-term deposit or fixed deposit, okay, uh, money market funds or uh, commercial paper or treasury bills. So these are all financial assets. Whereby we have operating assets which constitute most of a company's asset. They usually are valued at cost and are expected to yield returns in excess of the weighted average cost of capital. So many to this are of your PPE, your land building, what else? Your intangible asset, okay, your natural resources also is part of your operating assets. Assets that you acquire in order to uh, run your business activities, okay? Okay, now let's go to the first type of asset, which, uh, which is current asset. So current assets include cash and other assets that are convertible to cash usually within the operating cycle of the company. 
So what do you mean by operating cycles? Operating cycle is the process by which a company converts cash into short-term assets such as inventory and receivables and back into cash as part of its own going operating activities as you can see in exhibit 4.1 page 229 in fact in my slide also uh, you can see the same figure okay where you will start your cash as part of your capital okay and then you will use that cash to purchase your goods okay to purchase your raw materials and so on and then once the good reach your uh, business, okay, then you will convert them into finished goods and you will keep it as your inventory. So when your customer comes to your uh, outlet, for example, so they will purchase your product and you will sell them either by cash, by check, or even by credit. Then if you sell to your customer by credit term, meaning to say you're creating account receivables. So once your customer come back to you and they want to pay the amount due to you back. So then that receivable account will be converted into cash back. Okay, so start from cash and then the kapata balik is the cash. Or sometimes maybe from the inventory that you sell to your customer by cash or by check. So from the inventory, okay, it will not go to receivable but it will straight away go back to cash. So just skip one step here back to cash. So but whatever it is, it is still considered as an operating cycle. Okay, got it? All right, so down there, the, the, the author also uh, try to explain to us what do you mean by operating cycle. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the operating cycle is used to classify assets and liabilities as either current or non current So current assets are expected to be sold, collected, or used within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. So the excess of current assets over current liability is called working capital. Okay, so this is how the, the, the author tried to explain to us the, the explanation on the operating cycle. Okay, but right, now let's go to the first component under capital assets, which is cash and cash equivalent. All right, so here you ha we have receivables, prepaid expenses beside the cash and cash equivalent, and the, the next one will be inventories. So inventory will be a little bit special. So kita akan ada uh, slide yang berbeza untuk itu. Okay, now let's go to the first one, which is cash and cash equivalent. Now, when you are talking about cash, okay, so cash is the most liquid asset that must be available in any type of business organization. Why? Because if you don't have cash, then you might have problem in order to maintain your liquidity level. So what do you mean by liquidity level? I will explain it further later. Okay, so but our focus right now is cash. Okay, it, it, it doesn't, I, I can say that it doesn't mean anything if you have fine, you have very strong assets. But if the majority of your asset consists of your PPE or your uh, tangible asset, I can say it is meaningless. Why? Because that PPE, you cannot convert your PPE into cash in a short period of time because PPE is the most illiquid asset. Okay, asset yang sangat tidak cair. Ha, itu maksudnya. Tapi cash, as you can see, cash is the most liquid asset. It can be your currency, coins, and amounts on deposit in bank accounts checking accounts and some savings accounts. So meaning to say your money lah, duit, duit tunai ke, duit shilling ke, duit dalam bank ke, bank saving account ke, dalam current account, account semasa ke, tak kisahlah. So they consider itu sebagai cash. Okay, it's very important that any type of organization maintain their cash at the most what the reasonable level. Okay, next cash equivalent. So you have cash and cash equivalent. So you already know the meaning, the definition of cash. But how about cash equivalents? So cash equivalents are short-term and highly liquid investments that are readily convertible to a known cash amount. And in fact, it is close to maturity date and not sensitive to interest rate changes such as short-term T-bills or treasury bills, commercial paper, and money market funds. So some sort of you punya investment portfolio lah. Okay, investment instrument which which have maturity date less than a year. Uh, in short term fixed deposit. Okay, so these are all the example of cash equivalents. 
Okay. So I have uh, put some, uh, I did put some uh, extra knowledge here, which are not available in your textbook. So since I already gave the example in previous slide, so I think I need to uh, explain, I think uh, briefly, what do you mean by treasury bills, commercial paper and money market funds. And in fact, share with you the example of this uh, cash equivalents. Okay, now let's look at the first one, T bills or treasury bills. So this uh, short term maturity maturity notes which are issued by government through the country central bank. So we need to say, for example, if a Malaysia wants to issue the treasury bills, they will issue, okay, through Bank Negara Malaysia, BNM. Okay, so the citizens, the Malaysian citizens can subscribe to the bills. Why? Because these T bills have no explicit interest and in fact, it is a risk-free investment since it is being backed up by the government. So, risikonya boleh kata kosong ataupun kosong poin kosong kosong satu patu sahaja. Okay, pulangannya memang dijanjikan. So, begitu. So, this is T bill. Tapi kebanyakannya adalah short term. Okay, next will be commercial paper. Okay, again, it's a short-term debt instrument which issued by a corporations for the sake of financing of account receivable, inventories, and meeting short-term liabilities. And normally, commercial paper have maturity date not longer than 270 days. Okay, whereby for money market funds, it's a short-term security such as civil and commercial paper which provide low risk and low return investment. So these are the example of cash equivalents. Don't worry, it will not be tested in your test or even in your final exam because the tak ada pun dalam simple seal. It's just my effort to share the knowledge with you. Okay. Okay, so this is an example of the uh, T-bills that I mentioned before. Okay, and then I will nampak lah kat situ contoh daripada uh, Russian government, Jamaica. I think the other one is from France. Okay. And then this is uh, the example of commercial paper. I think money market fund tak ada. Commercial paper je lah yang ada. Okay. Now let's proceed, proceed to concept of liquidity. Okay. In the same uh, page there, page 229. Now let's go to the flag file. The concept of liquidity is important in financial statement analysis. By liquidity, we mean the amount of cash or cash equivalent the company has on hand and the amount of cash it can raise in a short period of time. Liquidity provides flexibility to take advantage of changing market conditions and to react to strategic actions by competitors. Liquidity also relates to the ability of a company to meet its obligation as the nature. So we need to see concept of liquidity ini bercerita tentang kecairan aset you. Okay, kenapa pentingnya okay, sesuatu organisasi itu perlu memastikan dia punya aset tu ada sistem liquidity yang bagus. Eh, liquidity system yang bagus. Okay. After all, kalau ada masalah dari segi liquidity of the assets, then I'm afraid that the organization might unable to meet its short-term obligation such as pay salary and wages, pay the utility expenses, the retail expenses, or the, all the management and operation expenses and so on. Okay, now, how can we as the organization maintain or increase our liquidity level? So here the authors, the author already uh, identified two steps that can be uh, implemented by the organization in order for them to increase or maintain the liquidity level at high. Okay, the first one is by billing the clients properly so that the organization will receive prompt payment. So we need to see between the organization and the receivable. So always make sure that the receivables pay the amount due to you, okay, according to the aging level, according to the schedule, for example. So make, make sure they don't uh, pass the deadline in order to pay the amount due, for example. Okay, the second step with that, okay, organizations should negotiate longer payment terms with the vendors or we need to say with the supplier. So it's between the organization or the business with the supplier or with the payables okay so try to negotiate longer payment with the supplier so that you can control your money you can control your cash you will not utilize it at a very huge amount in order to pay the the vendors 
Okay, so dengan erti kata lain Dengan kita punya customer, kita cepat-cepat minta duit Minta dia cepat-cepat bayar hutang Tapi kalau dengan kita punya supplier, pembekal kita Kita cuba hold Jangan cepat sangat bayar Kalau nak bayar pun, bayar sikit-sikit Jangan bayar sekali habis Walaupun kita dah duit Tapi bayar sikit-sikit uh, Okay, kenapa kena macam tu? Sebab kita, supaya kita ada cukup duit Untuk kita menjalankan perniagaan kita Operasi perniagaan tersebut Just imagine kalau customer bayar lambat Dan kita sibuk nak bayar kita punya hutang apa akan jadi pada duit cash yang dalam simpanan you? Duit itu akan cepat habis lah sebab apa? Duit cash sangat sangat cepat boleh berubah bentuk For example lah, let's say I bagi you sekarang ni pukul 2 lebih ni RM10 setiap seorang, I will transfer to everybody's bank account RM10 for each and every one of you in this class Okay, then I tunggu sampai pukul 8 malam lah At least pukul 8 malam I call balik ataupun I minta you Report dekat I, okay, what had you done with my 10 ringgit? Tak payah 10 ringgit lah, 50 ringgit, I up sikit 50 ringgit each of you Okay So you all ada berapa ramai dalam ni? 25 orang Okay, bagi I bagi 50 ringgit setiap seorang Sekarang, pukul 8 balik I nak minta you sediakan laporan Okay, apa yang you buat dengan I punya 50 ringgit tu? I can get 20 you Maybe about 80 to 90% of you 50 ringgit tu mesti dah terusik Mesti tak terusik, mesti dah terusik Even mungkin tak terusik sepenuhnya Maybe dah pakai sikit Dah beli top up lah Dah beli makan Pakai grab food lah Itulah beli inilah Macam-macam lah kan? Takkan nak simpan RM50 tu Tak terusik, mesti usik sikitnya Kalau tak usik hari ni, besok mesti dah pakai Sekejap je Benda tu boleh digunakan. Betul tak? So that is why dia kata tadi cash is the most liquid, as liquid asset. So sangat penting ada cash ni sebab kalau tak ada cash macam ni you bayar, bayar gaji pekerja. There are organizations out there, dia memang ada aset yang sangat banyak. We have plenty of PPE there. Bangunan dia banyak gila. Lepas tu bangunan pula tinggi-tinggi tingkat dia. Kereta penuh satu gudang. Tapi bila tengok dalam bank account, sikit tak ada duit. Kalau ada pun sikit je. Jadi bila hujung bulan nak bayar gaji pekerja macam mana? Tell me. Nak jual kereta, kena jual dulu baru dapat duit Itu pun kena tengok ada tak bayar Sama juga dengan jual bangunan, nak jual bangunan tu Boleh makan masa hampir satu tahun tau baru dapat duit balik Nampak tak? Lambat kan? Lambat Tapi kalau cash money Sekejap, settle Okay, so that is why It is very important for any business organization to maintain Its liquidity level at the maximum Alright Ah, okay, so, dapat eh, faham eh? Do you have any questions to ask class? Ada soalan nak tanya? Tak ada, sir. Boleh faham? Okay. Not yet, sir. Boleh faham, sir. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, now let's go to receivables. Another component in current asset. So, you already aware the definition of receivable. Dah tahu kan what they mean by receivables. And mostly, you you play around with trade receivable. Okay, so receivables are amount due from others that arise from the sale of goods or services or the loaning of money. Selalunya sampai kat situ je lah, services saja. When you provide services or sell goods to your customer and then receivable might appear. But, just bear in mind that receivable also can appear when you loan your money to anybody. Okay, so we have two type of receivable actually. So we have trade receivable and non-trade receivable. Trade receivable is normally accounts receivable lah. Okay, which refer to the oral premises of indebtedness due from customer. Just your own customer. When your customer purchase a product from you, then the accounts receivable might appear. And in fact, and we have another type of receivable which is non-trade receivable or notes receivable which refer to formal written premises of indebtedness due from others. Meaning to say, it's not from your customer so Other than that Okay, there is an organization Sometimes they provide soft loan to the employees Sometimes kan, bila tengah-tengah bulan Ada client, apa, 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 uh, pekerja kan Employees datang jumpa bos, minta apa? Minta pinjam duit, minta advance dan sebagainya So, these are all the not receivable So, kadang-kadang organisasi bagi So, bagi dan dia tulis lah Create satu account, okay, si Polan, Ben Polan pinjam duit syarikat Nanti kena bayar balik So kenapa dia cuka pinjam kepada syarikat atau perniagaan Dia tak pinjam dengan bank sebab kalau pinjam dengan bank Dia ada tempoh lah, dia kena sign agreement lah Kalau lambat kena pergi mahkamah lah, contohnya Tapi kalau dengan syarikat, 
kalau lambat bayar, it's okay syarikat boleh potong gaji so selamat, lebih selamat dan kebanyakannya so, uh, not receivable ni amountnya tak banyak amountnya kecil dan uh, tempo pinjamannya pun tak panjang I can show the example to you right now okay for example here okay you have the promissory note okay uh, subscribe by Robert Ward okay kat situ kan dia tengok you can see the the value of the notes there two thousand dollar and then the duration is only sixty days and then down there you have Jim Red okay which uh, acquire one thousand dollar at four months date okay so the value is small and the du duration is short so that is not receivable okay you got it right next in term of evaluation of receivable so in practice companies will report the receivables at their net realizable value so what do you mean by the net realizable value the total of amount receivables less an allowance for uncollectable accounts now what do you mean by un allowance for uncollectable accounts uh i don't know what is the term that you use okay but certain you certain author they they uh, call it allowance for doubtful debt you all tak tahu pakai term apa allowance for apa apa you pakai term apa yang you pakai untuk calculate receivable ni kan bila you record dalam you punya statement of financial position so the total receivable tu kena tolak dengan bad debt satu lagi dia kena tolak dengan allowance allowance apa nama dia kalau you all belajar bagi tahu eh apa dia impairment 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 ah ya allowance for impairment itu je joint receivable Oh, allowance for impairment to receivable. Allowance for impairment. Oh, okay, okay. Im impairment, how to spell impairment? I-M-P-A-I-R, right? Yes, sir. Oh, I, I see. Okay. Yeah. Oh, allowance for impairment to receivable. Lah. Okay, tak kisahlah. I, okay, the term uh, are different but the definition is the same. Okay. Now let's continue. So management estimate the allowance for this uncollectible based on experience, customer fortunes, economy and industrial expectations and collection policies. So based on the management estimation. Okay, because they come with percentage, isn't it? So every year might have different percentage. Sometimes they provide 5% allowance, sometimes 3% or sometimes even 10% allowance. So how can the management come up with the percentage of the allowance based on the experience, customer fortunes, economy and industry expectation as well as the collection policies. Okay, so we will look at the, the, the surrounding before they come up with the percentage of the allowance for uncollectable accounts. Okay, now let's go to the analyzing receivables. So how can we analyze the receivables in the organization? So actually you have three steps. Okay, number one, collection risk. Number two, authenticity of receivables. And number three will be securitization of receivables. So for collection risk ni, dia lebih kepada we review the allowance for other uncollectable accounts just now. Okay, how can we review the allowance? Okay, you have few methods there such as determining the competitor's receivable as a percent of sales. So meaning to say you compare uh with the receivables uh competitors punya allowance and then examining the customer concentration invest investigating the age pattern of the receivables determining portion of receivable that is a renewal of prior receivables as well as analyzing the adequacy of allowances for discounts returns and other credits so these are all the example on how can we review the allowance for uncollect the first type of analyzing the receivables. Now, the second method will be authenticity of the receivable. When you say kita nak tahu kesahihan the receivable tersebut. So, how can you ensure the authenticity of receivables such as review the credit policy, review the return policy as well as review any contingencies on the receivables. You can, you can read details in page 231 and 232, okay? So I will not explain to you in details lah because dia akan makan banyak masa juga. Alright, yang penting kita tahu on the basic things. Okay, the third uh, method will be securitization or factory. Okay, securitization ni macam mana? So another important analysis issue arises when a company sells all or a portion of its receivables to a third party which typically finances the sale by selling bonds to the capital markets. 
The collection of those receivables provide the source for the yield on the bond. Such practice is called the securitization. Okay, the securitization means you jual you punya receivable kepada third party. Okay, sama ada sepenuhnya ataupun a portion of your receivable to a third party. Okay, so this receivable can be sold with or without recourse to a buyer. So what do you mean by recourse? Recourse refer to guarantee of collectability. Okay, so sale of receivable with recourse doesn't effectively transfer risk of ownership. I have a videos that can, I have a video that can share with you, that show to you what do you mean by this securitization or factory. Okay, this activity quite new in Malaysia, tapi dekat luar dia dah quite popular. Alright, so uh, I pun tak apa-apa nak familiar with this factoring but then it's okay I have my own effort in order to make sure my students uh, understand a little bit what do you mean by factoring. Now let's go to the video uh, in the next slide. Okay, I play a video ni. Hi, my name is Paddy Hirsch, I'm the senior editor of Marketplace. Today I want to talk about factoring. It's a kind of uh, financing method used by small businesses. And it's been in the news a lot recently because of a company called CIT, the lender and a big factor. And uh, people are worried, small businesses are worried that if it goes out of business, it could leave them short of the financing that they need. So how does factoring work? Let's cover that for you. Well, for starters, let's start with um, the relationship between the small business owner and, and, his, and his client. Okay, so here we are. Our small business owner's name is Sam, okay, and he is a shoemaker makes these very trendy shoes. shoes. And uh, he cranks out about 20 pairs of these shoes, a, 20 pairs of these shoes a month. But one client, which is uh, Nordstrom's, okay? and um, Nordstrom buys all 20 pairs every single month. So at the end of every month, um, boxes up with 20 pairs of shoes, ships them off to Nordstrom, and includes invoice for uh, $4,000 as well. Beautifully handmade shoes. Okay. So four thousand dollars is the invoice. And at the end of the month, or after thirty days, or after how many days, or, or, or whatever is specified on the invoice, JW Nordstrom lives up to its end of the bargain and returns four thousand dollars to Sam. Okay. Sam's obviously built a little bit in there, so he can you know, run his business if he needs to. He can buy a few little extra materials. But essentially, Sam is uh, he's, a, he's a one man band. He runs this he runs the shop on his own, and uh, his his, his cost cycle is, is pretty tight. What happens if you want to, uh, to expand in some way or perhaps experiment with new materials that are much more expensive? But he's going to need to get some financing from somewhere. So he might go to a bank. But uh, bank loan is kind of difficult to get, especially right now. Plus, it's quite onerous. You know, it takes a long time. You have to go through your books and look at all these different things. It's, it can be tricky. Plus, the, the, uh, the rates can be very high. And uh, they come with all of these rather onerous covenants or potentially onerous covenants that uh, force you to earn a certain amount of money and all this kind of stuff. Same with small business administration loans. You know, they are, they might be too onerous for Sam to look into. So he looks for another option, which is, uh, he comes across the factor. Now in this relationship here, we have uh, two parties. Party one is Sam, party two is, uh, is Nordstrom. In a factoring agreement, we have a third party. Okay? And uh, our factor is called Ed. Okay? It's a sort of jolly banker looking chap here. And um, he looks at Sam's business and he says, uh, okay, um, I, can, I can front you some money, which is essentially what it's going to do. What I'll do, you need money, I've got money, and um, I've got a trade for you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you $3,500 a month in exchange for your invoices. Okay, you give me your $4,000 invoice every month, the one that you submit to JW Nordstrom, and I will give you $3,500. So, you know, you're buying it at a discount. Awesome what it costs for his fees and also for any kind of risk. Okay, so here's the way the money goes. Sam gives this invoice, this $4,000 invoice, he gives a copy of it, okay, to Ed, his copy. So now, Ed has become a collector. He now owns this $4,000 invoice. In return for the invoice, he gives $3,500 to Sam. Okay, and then at the end of the 30 days or whatever period it is that's mentioned on the invoice, Nordstrom gives four thousand dollars not to Sam, okay, but to Ed. Okay, so in this part of the transaction, like all the money goes to Ed. So what's happened here? 
essentially what this is, is a transfer of risk, okay? Because there's a risk in this invoice. JW Nordstrom might have some problems with its business, so it might want to push back the, the invoice for maybe six weeks, or maybe it's having so many problems that say it pays less than the $4,000. Maybe it has so many problems that it can't pay the invoice at all, maybe it goes out of business. So there's a risk in holding this invoice, you know? Sam maybe he doesn't want that risk, okay? So what he's done is he's passed on the risk to Ed. What Sam has got, he's got $3,500 cash in hand, guaranteed every month for as long as this relationship exists. Ed is going to give him $3,500 every month. Then Ed is going to assume the risk for this, uh, for this invoice. It's up to Ed to do the collecting. It's up to Ed to make contact with J.W. Nordstrom and say, hey, where's my money? This is not Ed's responsibility. So Sam gets his money, he's able to do whatever he wants with it, and he passed on that, that own, potentially owner's responsibility to Ed. Obviously, he's done it at a discount, so he's $500 out. But there may be a lot of convenience in that. Okay. So what are the risks here? Well, obviously the risk is now all assumed by by Ed, as I said, that JW Nordstrom has a bunch of issues. There's also a risk to Sam if there's a problem with Ed. I mean, Ed say has got a lot of these relationships, and maybe some of them break down. Maybe he's got some other loans out of some other factoring dealers out, and he's the companies that he's the JW Nordstrom that he's doing business with, going to go out of business, who is not collecting his money every month. Well, suddenly. Ed is, is having problems. This is what's happening to CIT right now. CIT is having problems and it could go bankrupt. So what happens if CIT does go bankrupt? It means suddenly that the factor is out of the picture. And Sam is now back to his old relationship okay, with Nordstrom. Nordstrom's now going to be paying him again. If Sam needs capital, say that he has expanded, says he has extended his business and he needs that extra capital, that guarantee of capital, every month to come on in, it means he's going to have to go somewhere else for it. Maybe he's going to have to try and find another factor. But a lot of people are now looking at the factoring business and saying, the way that CIT's gone, we don't want to be in this business anymore. It's too risky. It's now back to the banks. Or maybe selling equity in his, in his shoe company. Maybe it means that somebody's going to want to come in and take 50% of the company. Maybe he doesn't want that. But it's back to the banks. And the banks mean those onerous um, restrictions on your credit, those explorations into your balance sheet where they're looking into every nook and cranny of your business. And maybe also, extremely high interest rates if you actually do manage to uh, to get uh, permission from them or they, they do agree to lend uh, money to you. High interest rates, onerous covenants, you know, and that whole relationship with the bank that can be quite sticky for small businesses. Well, so at CIT does go under. It could leave people like Sam very badly. Okay. Do you have any questions regarding the explanation of this uh, speaker? Ada masalah tak? Faham tak apa yang dimasukkan? Saya faham tak apa yang dia cakap kan? Kurang sikit. Kurang sikit. Okay, dia macam ni. Okay, it start with Sam. Nombor satu tu kalau awak nampak gambar raja tu, dia mula dengan Sam. So, Sam ni siapa? Sam ni shoemaker. Pembuat kasut. Okay, so setiap bulan dia buat banyak kasut dan dia akan hantar kasut dia kepada satu kedai. Kedai tu namanya JWN. Saya nampak nombor dua tu kan? Okay, so setiap bulan JWN ni akan tempah 20 pasang kasut kulit yang berharga RM4,000 keseluruhannya lah. So that's why you boleh nampak ada tulis invoice 4K. Nampak kan dia tulis invoice 4K tu. So invoice 4K tu maksudlah jualan lah. Jualan daripada Sam dia jual kepada JWN. 20 pasang kasut dengan total harga semuanya adalah RM4,000. Okay jadi itu adalah circle dia. So Sam akan buat kasut jual ke JWN dia bagi invoice dan JWN ni akan bayar kepada Sam RM4,000. It's a normal business transaction there. Tapi masalahnya adalah Bila kalau anda kata JWN ni ada masalah dari segi cash flow dia So dia akan effect Sam Anda kata Sam nak expand business dia ataupun nak beli dia punya barang lagi kan Nak beli bahan mentah lagi, nak buat kasut dia akan jadi masalah Sebab apa bila JWN ni lambat bayar ataupun tak bayar hutang kepada Sam ni kan Hutang RM4,000 ni Jadi masalah lah kepada cash flow Sam ni Jadi Sam tak boleh nak buat operasi macam biasa Kasut dah jual Tapi duit tak dapat-dapat lagi Understand? Jadi dia perlukan duit dengan cepat. Jadi apa dia buat? Dia mengamalkan konsep factoring. Okay, factoring ni apa? Okay, dia jumpa dengan ad. Ad ni adalah, orang kata agent factoring. So, apa, apa guna ad ni? Okay, apa Sam akan kata? Okay, Sam akan bagi satu salinan. Nampak tak yang ada titik-titik petak ni, invoice 4K. Ini adalah salinan kepada invoice yang asal tadi. So, apa Sam akan buat? Sam akan bagi satu salinan ini, invoice tersebut kepada ad. So, dekat sini dah berlakunya factoring ni. So maksudnya dia jual invoice invoice kepada JWN ni kepada Ed. So sebagai pulangannya, 
apa ad akan buat? Ad akan bayar Sam sebanyak $3,500 setiap kali invoice hantar ke JWN. Invoice RM4,000 lah. So maksudnya ad akan claim RM500 daripada invoice tersebut. So bila dah berlaku handover of the invoice from Sam kepada ad, so meaning to say JWN ini bertanggungjawab untuk bayar hutang bukan lagi kepada Sam tapi, tapi kepada siapa? Kepada ad. Nampak tak anak panah hijau yang panjang ni? Dia terus pergi ke siapa? Pergi kepada ad. So maksudnya Sam, dia buat kasut, dia jual kepada JWN. Okay, tapi JWN tak akan bayar kepada Sam. Tapi bayar kepada apa? Bayar kepada factor tadi. Agent, factor agent which is ad. So ad as a return, ad akan jan janjikan dengan Sam $3,500 setiap kali Sam keluarkan invoice kepada JWN. Macam tu. So we need to say whatever it is, risiko kelambatan. Ha, apa ayat dia kan? Risiko ketidaknya uh, ke, ke kelembapan JWN ini untuk bayar hutang dia tu akan hilang daripada Sam because risiko tu dah pindah, pindahkan kepada siapa? Risiko tersebut had been transfer to Ed. So Sam tak payah risau sebab apa? Ed dah janji dengan dia. Dia akan dapat $3,500 untuk setiap transaksi yang dia buat antara Sam dengan JWN. Jadi Sam tak akan risau walaupun dia dapat sedikit tapi it's okay. Dia still masih selesa. Sebab, sebab 4K ni kan sekali dengan profit, dia dah jual sekali dengan profit untuk 20 pasang kasut tersebut. Jadi penurunan sedikit daripada 4K ke 3500 ni but this still okay bagi Sam. Cuma masalah ni sekarang apa speaker ni kata adalah isu ni adalah risiko dia, risiko andai kata factor ni, agent factor ni, okay, ad tersebut pula yang mengalami masalah. Contohnya dia mungkin ada buat factor dengan orang lain juga kan. Jadi mungkin dia ada masalah dari segi cash flow dia menyebabkan dia gagal ataupun ada masalah nak bayar Sam. Jadi bila macam tu putuslah hubungan antara Ed dengan Sam then Sam akan patah balik kepada dia punya original relationship between Sam dengan JWN. So buat, akan buat bisnes macam biasa. Jadi risiko pada Sam ni dia dah terkecil. Dulu risiko dia agak besar sebab apa takutkan JWN tak nampu nak bayar. Dia pun tak ada duit nak holding modal dia, nak beli bahan mentah dia. Jadi risiko tu dia pindahkan kepada Ed. Tapi kalau anda kata Ed pun gagal bayar tapi tak apa sebab Sam masih pegang invoice yang original tu jadi JWN walaupun dia tak bayar pada Ed, dia still kena bayar pada Sam mana kata hubungan antara Sam dengan Ed ni dah putus dari segi factoring agent tadi. Understand? So this is securitization ataupun factoring. Dapat tak? Boleh faham? Sir. Yes. Apa, apa dia? Untung Apa dia? Apa keuntungan Ed tolong JWN tu? Apa apa hubungan? Apa so, keuntungan? Tak... Apa kepentingan? Keuntungan dia. Oh apa keuntungan dia? Apa keuntungan ad tu? Apa yang apa yang ad yang akan dapat? Kita lagi nampak ad akan dapat 4000. Ni pasal tak? Okey andai kata situasi ni adalah normal maksudnya JWN akan terus bayar. So bila agent JWN akan bayar, dia bayar berapa? Dia bayar 4000 kepada ad. Ad akan gunakan duit pembayaran tersebut bagi kepada Sam RM3,500. Jadi berapa yang masuk dalam poket ad? RM500. Kerja dia just kutip hutang je. Faham tak? Itu kalau satu klien. Kalau so dia ada banyak klien. Again? So Sam lah dia nanti dia dapat kurang kan? Dapat kurang RM500. Haa Sam akan dapat kurang RM500. Tapi tapi bagi dia dalam situasi ini it's okay rather than dia tak dapat langsung ataupun dia dapat terlalu sikit dia mungkin perlukan modal dengan cepat untuk rolling balik modal dia kan cash money tu untuk dia maintain liquidity level dia supaya dia boleh beli bahan mentah dia bayar gaji pekerja dia expand business dia so kalau nak tunggu JWN bayar lambat jadi apa dia buat okey dapat dapat juga 1000 setengah dapat juga cash money so 500 tu macam fees lah fees kepada ad bayar fees kepada ad untuk setiap satu invoice tersebut so ad dia dia ad ni buat, buat duit daripada situ lah Bila berlaku handover of the invoice, ah, then Ed akan dapat dia punya kata service fees dia dekat situ. Dia mahu RM500 untuk setiap satu invoice. Understand? Of course lah invoice ni takkanlah harga kos saja. Kot Sam charge kepada JWN mestilah dia harga akan charge sekali dengan harga jualan untuk sepasang kasut ni. Jadi kehilangan RM500 tu bagi dia mungkin tak terlalu signifikan sangat. Okay fine, dia still boleh cover profit juga dan barang bahan mentah masih boleh dapat. Cuma keuntungan dia jatuh sedikit daripada keuntungan asal dia. But dia, dia punya objektif dia apa? Objektif dia adalah dia nak dapatkan duit dengan cepat. 
nak tunggu customer bayar mungkin lambat jadi dia nak dapatkan duit dengan cepat okey dia terpaksa lah gadaikan sikit RM500 dia korbankan RM500 dia bagi kepada ejen so ejen akan gantikan bagi pihak dia untuk kutip hutang dengan customer tu nampak? kiranya se ad ni bagi uh, modal dekat Sam lah bukanlah bagi modal maksudnya dia nanti duit Ah, dia duit dia tu dia dapat daripada JWN tu Yes, yes Tapi so, si dapat... app ni peranan dia bagi duit dulu dekat Sam tu Ya, yeah, pandai pun Dia akan bagi duit pada Sam tu Nanti dia akan kutip lah dengan JWN ni Ah, dia punya servis tu dia ambil RM500 untuk yes, dia Yes, exactly ha, Pandai pun So maksudnya um, dia akan ambil Dia akan gunakan tu Dia potong RM500 untuk fees dia lah Sebagai pengutip hutang uh, Agent, factoring agent ni Ha, tapi dia dah akan dahulukan duit dia dulu. Okey, dia bagi dulu RM1,500. Okey, Sam bagi invoice. Okey, then Ad akan pergi jumpa JWN minta hutang. So, dia akan ambil lah semua tu. So, bila difference kan ada difference dia. RM4,000 tolak RM1,500 tu akan masuk pekat Ad lah. Okey. Dapat yang lain? Faham tak? Ya, yeah, faham. Faham. Boleh eh? Clear eh? Ah, okay, this is how factoring is involved. So, might be benda ni something new to you. In fact, something new for me. In fact, masa I kerja dulu pun, I tak pernah jumpa factoring activities ni eh. So, benda ni agak baru. Okay, but something good yang kita belajar lah. Ah, betul tu. Terus so, kat Malaysia, dia tak tak tahulah dah ada memang tengah berjalan ke factoring I pun tak pasti. Ah, okay. Selalunya government je. Kan? Ah, ha, so, maksudnya dia nak nanti LO kan? Yes, anda ha. ah, Dia nak minta LO cepat semua kan? So, dia akan nanti agent lah macam tu. Ah, begitu. So, agent tu akan potong lah fees tu. Dia akan ambil sikit, makan sikit duit tu. Ah, macam tu lah. Okay, that's how they, they run their, their punya factory activities. Okay? So, yang lagi soalan lagi nak tanya? Ada lagi soalan nak tanya? Okay, good. Alright. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, next one will be prepaid expenses. So prepaid expenses, you can go to page 234. So prepaid expenses ni tahulah apa dia kan. So these are advance payment for services or goods not yet received. Such as uh, advance payment for rental, insurance, utilities and property taxes. Okay, so we will only analyze this prepaid when their amount is large or when there is any substantial changes in prepaid expenses. Bila amount dia sangat besar, sangat signifikan ataupun perbezaan amount prepaid daripada tahun semasa dengan tahun yang sebelumnya tu agak besar. Okey, agak signifikan lah. Then baru kita analyze. Selalunya kalau macam ni kita nak analyze prepaid ni dan kita akan go through in term of dia punya accounting entries, double entries, the supporting document and so on. Itu sajalah. So prepayment ni dia tak banyak, tak banyak, tak banyak masalah sangat. Uh, okay, berbeza dengan yang sebelum ni such as cash, cash equivalent, receivable and in fact dengan inventories. Okay, now let's go to the, the next part which are your inventories in page 234. Okay, for inventories, uh, you can jumpa balik dengan you punya valuation method such as FIPO, uh, LIFO and weighted average method but uh, in this uh, chapter I will not discuss on how to prepare your stock sheet lah. Okay, because uh, we aware that the students are uh, already familiar with the uh, preparation of your stock valuation card. Okay, by using different methods. Okay, such as FIFO, LIFO and weighted average method. Okay, but for this uh, syllabus in this chapter, we are focusing on analyzing the implications of every single methods that adopt by the organization okay towards the profitable profitability of the organization towards the uh, amount of the closing inventory in the financial position and in fact the implication of the methods to the cash flow of the business okay so kita akan tengok kat situ so first of all let's look at the definition of the inventories so inventories are goods held for sale or goods acquired or in process of being ready for sale as part of a company's normal operation. So that's a basic definition of inventories. In fact, if you refer to the standard, okay, MFRS 102, all right, so in terms of the measurement, it's classified that the inventories shall be measured at the lower of cost and net realizable value. Okay, so I will not explain further about this because I believe that you already covered in your uh, other far papers for this standard. So I takkan sentuh lah. So I cuma just nak share saja in term of the definition and the measurement of the inventories. Apa yang I nak fokuskan kat sini adalah okay in term of the accounting and devaluation method. So as you can see in the pie chart, 
All right, the first three methods that most popular used by the organizations are FIFO, uh, LIFO, and weighted average method. Itu yang paling popular lah ketiga-tiga ni. So, we will look at the uh, these three methods and the implications to the financial statement. Okay, now. So, first of all, in terms of first in, first out, kita dah tahu. Okay, the oldest cost will be used in order to calculate the cost of goods sold. Okay, so it means what is left in your uh, closing inventory will be the one with the recent cost. Okay, yang paling latest lah. Okay, however, for last in, first out, Okay, so the recent cost will be used in order to calculate the cost of goods sold. So, meaning to say, the one will be left in your closing inventory will be the one with the oldest cost. Cost yang paling lama sekali tinggal. Because lama je pun last in first out. Okay, when you buy for a weighted average cost, so when a unit is sold, the average cost of each unit in inventory is assigned to cost of goods sold. So, you need to calculate the cost per unit every single time you want to issue. Okay, how to calculate the cost per unit? Okay, cost of goods available for sale divide with the units available on the date of issue. Okay, so now let's look at this illustration. So what you can see is that you have a uh, opening stock, opening inventory in year two, where you have forty units with the cost per unit five hundred dollar, and the total is twenty thousand dollar. Okay, and then during the year you acquire or you purchase a new stock or new inventories, okay, uh, 60 unit with the cost of $600 per unit and the total amount will be $36,000. So, meaning to say your cost goods available for sale will be $56,000 and you have 100 units in your hand right now. Okay, so that note that in year 2, 30 units are sold for $800 each and the total sales revenue for that year will be $24,000. So, 30 times 800 and you get your $24,000. Now, by using the same facts here, okay, and we try to come up with the different, uh, we want to look at the different perspective of each method. So, kita nak tengok apa perbezaan dia. Alright, now, these are the illustration of the costing method using both FIFO, LIFO, and average method. So, what you can see up there, yang sebelah atas, okay, so, you can see that the inventory, uh, opening inventory still same. The net purchases still same, but the cost of goods sold is different. Okay, so, if you use LIFO, you will get higher cost of goods sold as you compare when you use FIFO. Why? Because the cost per unit of the product that you to be used in the cost of goods sold is differ. Kalau FIFO, you gunakan yang paling lama. So, yang lama harganya $500 sahaja. Tapi kalau LIFO, you pakai $600 per unit. So, that is why your cost of goods sold for FIFO, $15 and a little bit lower as compared to LIFO, which is $18,000. So, as a result, when you look at the inventory, closing inventory, you can see that FIFO will record higher ending inventory as compared with the LIFO. Okay, so meaning to say asset dalam FIFO akan lebih tinggi lah daripada as current asset kalau gunakan LIFO. Okay, so assumes that sales of the 55,000 for the period. Okay, then gross profit under each method will be, okay, so sales yang sama. So you boleh tampak kat situ, the cost of goods sold dah berbeza tadi. So, mean, meaning to say your GP for different uh, method will be differ. So, if you plan to show higher profit, then you should not implement LIFO. Then you perlu pakai FIFO. So, that your gross profit will show higher in term of value as compared to LIFO. Right? So, using, using the same information, using, you are using the same facts, but the output is differ according to the methods that you adopt. Okay, so FIFO, bagian, sekian, LIFO, sekian, average method, sekian. So, it depends on the management to choose which method to be used in order to value the inventories. Okay, alright, got it. Okay, so it's every single method will show different implication, alright. So, this will be the effects. Lah. So, you can analyze the inventory costing method Okay, the costing effects. So, in terms of profitability, okay, assuming that the, the, the cost per unit of the product keep on increasing. 
So if you adopt FIFO, so FIFO will produce higher gross profit than NIFO. Whereby under statement of financial position in the periods of rising prices, LIFO will report ending inventories at prices lower than replacement cost. Why? Because in LIFO, okay, the one that will be your closing inventory will be the oldest cost. And then last one, what will be the effects of the inventory costing method to the cash flow? So in period of rising prices, FIFO result in higher pre-tax income and higher tax liability. Why? Because the cost profit is higher as compared to FIFO, LIFO and weighted average method. So when you have higher tax, higher pre-tax income, higher tax liability, meaning to say it can lead to liquidity problem. Why? Because you need to pay more for your tax. Understand? So these are the effects. Ini, ini memang selalu keluar dalam panel exam. Alright? So you can go through the, the Page 236, uh, 237 uh, for the explanation in detail. Okay, right. Any questions so far? Ada soalan nak tanya? Yeah, so, kita memang, yes. kita memang kena pilih satu method je eh? In real, yeah lah. Memang of course lah kena pakai satu method saja. Kalau tidak macam mana you nak report you punya financial statement? Hmm, saya uh, ingat kalau macam cost of goods sold boleh pilih uh -huh. yang macam ni. Waktu nak gross profit tinggi boleh pilih yang macam ni. Tak eh. Kena pilih oh satu. tak, tak, tak. Of course you kena pakai satu method saja. You need to adopt one. So every single method they have their own pro and cons lah. Ada kelebihan dia, ada kekurangan dia. So it depends. Uh, okay kalau you kata you nak tunjukkan profit yang tinggi, you kena pakai FIFO. Tapi at the same time you tak nak bayar cukai tinggi. Uh, macam mana tu? So nampak tak? You tak nak bayar cukai tinggi, dan you pakai LIFO. Tapi you, at the same time, you nak profit tinggi, dan you tak pakai, boleh pakai LIFO. So, we need to see every single method yang you nak gunakan tu, dia ada dia punya kelemahan dan kelebihan dia. So, terpulang kepada management nak yang mana satu. Ha, dia pilih-pilih. Right? Kalau you jenis yang kita okay, nak ambil risiko, dan pakai tengah-tengah lah. Tengah-tengah apa? Average method lah. So, if you look at the average method, you can see that the value of average method will be in the middle between FIFO and LIFO. Tahu tak? Dia tengah-tengah. Ke LIFO pun tidak, ke life, ke FIFO pun tidak. So, dia in the middle. So, so the implication or the effect might be there but not, but not so significant. Uh, okay. Gross profitnya tak terlalu tinggi dan dia punya apa nama, uh, cost of goods sold pun tak terlalu tinggi. So, just nice in between. So, boleh pakai average method. Uh, okay, sir. Dapat? Okay. Okay, good. Alright. Okay, so next one will be the long-term asset. Okay, so here we will look at the definition, the accounting for long-term asset and then the capitalizing versus expensing in terms of financial statement and depreciation effects. Okay, now let's continue. So in terms of definition, so kita dah tahu what do you mean by long-term asset ataupun uh, your non-current assets. So long-term assets are resources that are used to generate operating revenues or reduce operating costs for more than one period. So the most common type of your long-term asset is your tangible fixed asset. Okay, and then you also have intangible asset and as well as natural resources. Okay, tangible fixed asset ni macam mana? Macam you punya PPE lah. Intangible asset such as your patents, trademark, copyrights as well as your goodwill. Okay, and then you have your uh, different charges such as your R&D expenditures as well as your natural resources. So these are all are examples of your non-current asset or long-lived assets. Okay, right. Now let's go to the accounting for long-term asset. So every single uh, asset that I mentioned before, they have their own uh, measurement, isn't it? Okay, so here uh, the author tried to uh, differentiate between capitalization, allocation and impairment. So what do you mean by capitalization? Allocation and payment. Now, looking at page two, four, three, and the in the bottom of that page, okay, the author tried to simplify the definition of capitalization, allocation, and payment. Now, let's go to the paragraph there. Capitalization is the process of deferring a cost that is incurred in the current period, but whose benefits are expected to extend to one or more future periods. It is capitalization that creates an asset account. Whereby allocation is the process of periodically expensing a deferred cost asset to one or more future expected benefit periods, okay, which called depreciation for tangible asset, amortization for intangible asset, 
and depletion for natural resources. So that is allocation. Whereby impairment, so impairment is the process of writing down the book value of the asset when its expected cash flows are no longer sufficient to recover the remaining cost reported on the balance sheet. Ini bila kita mengamalkan fair value accounting. So akan banyaklah berlaku impairment. Sama ada impairment loss ataupun impairment gain. Okay, baik kita akan pergi in details the next part the next part. Okay, so the first one will be capitalization. Now, what do you mean by capitalization here? Okay, so as I mentioned before, it is a process of deferring a cost that is incurred in the current period and whose benefits are expected to extend to one or more future period. So we need to see you expand, you berbelanja untuk asset you, and then dalam pada masa sama bila you berbelanja untuk asset you, itu menyebabkan asset you Uh, meningkat dari segi dia punya capacity, dari segi dia punya efficiency and productivity level so kalau begitu, then you can capitalize. So apa beza capitalize dengan expense ni? Dia ada beza, dia berlawanan capitalization and expensing capitalization maksudnya cost yang you belanjakan untuk aset tersebut you akan masukkan di dalam statement of financial position dan you akan consider dia sebagai you punya aset tapi kalau you expense off Expensing. Expensing maksudnya you charge semua perbelanjaan yang berkaitan dengan you punya PPE tadi, you consider sebagai belanja, expenses. Contohnya, contohnya eh, you ada motor vehicle, kereta lah for example. So belanja minyak, belanja cuci, kereta, belanja apa lagi? Nak polish lah, lepas tu you nak service, monthly service, tukar tayar, semua ni Capitalization ataupun expensing. Now, what do you think? Is it for the maintenance purpose or you can improve the productivity level? Sebelum ni kereta you lah kelajuan dia 120 km sejam. Bila cuci dah kilat kelajuan dia 300 km sejam. Ada ke macam tu? Tak. Nah, yeah. Tak kan? Dia still macam tu juga. Still macam tu isi minyak hijau ke, minyak yang paling mahal sekali, minyak warna apa tu kalau dekat Patron tu, yang yang Alphon 100, ha, harga dia dekat RM2 selita tu, adakah kelajuan dia akan macam nak-canak naik? Tak, tak juga, ha. betul tak? So benda tu adalah expenses, so bila expenses, you just expensing the value in your statement of profit or loss. Capitalization ni macam mana? Contohnya daripada kereta sedan biasa tu you modify modify sat, selalunya satu kereta boleh naik naik empat orang tiba-tiba selepas you modify boleh naik lapan orang ha. Now what you can see maksudnya you productivity ataupun the the efficiency of that motor vehicle dah meningkat dulu sekali jalan dia boleh bawa empat orang sahaja but now boleh naik lapan orang selepas you modify kenderaan tersebut So dia punya productivity dah meningkat. So bila productivity meningkat, kos untuk membaik pulih kenderaan tersebut kita akan capitalize. Akan menyebabkan asset you meningkat. Understand? So for cost to be capitalized, it must meet each of the following criteria. So dia kena fulfill semua ni dulu baru you boleh capitalize. First, it must arise from a past transaction or event. It must yield identifiable and reasonably probable future benefit. Maksudnya bila you buat then you you know the, the the useful life of that particular asset can be extend from 5 to 7 or 8 years it must allow owner control over the future benefits maksudnya aset tu adalah milik perniagaan tersebutlah janganlah you pre capitalize aset orang lain lepas tu cost tu you masuk dalam you punya aset tak boleh lah because itu bukan you punya kan ha uh, okay alright so all of these criteria must be fulfilled so that that particular cost can be capitalized under your asset Okay, so that is capitalization. Next will be allocation. So allocation is the process of periodically expensing a different cost, okay, which is the cost of asset to one or more future expected benefit period. Maksudnya to the useful life lah. Kalau five years, five years lah. They allocate. Kalau seven years, seven years lah. Okay, determined by the benefit period, salvage value and allocation method. Kalau tangible fixed asset, dia panggil depreciation. Ini biasa kan kita dengar. For intangible asset, they call it amortization. But for natural resources, dia panggil depletion. Natural resources ni macam apa? Natural resources ni adalah sumber-sumber yang tak ada ganti. Yang tiada substitute. Okay, will not be renew. Will not be replaced. No. Maksudnya habis-habislah. Contohnya macam apa? Petrol. Habis-habis petrol lah. Mana ada tambah lagi? Ha. Kayu balak. Habis you tarah semua pokok, tak ada lagi. Melainkan you tanam lah. Nampak? 
Okay, so that will be natural resources depletion. They can gunakan term depletion. Okay, next impairment. Impairment is the process of writing down the asset value when it's expected. Cash flows are less than its carrying value. So, bila you buat fair value accounting yang mana kita buat comparison between the carrying amount and the market value. So, kalau dah kata carrying amount you tu terlalu tinggi tapi market value tu rendah, then you tetap paksa lah buat impairment adjustment dan berlakulah impairment loss kat situ. Because why? We need to follow the market value kan? Okay, so that will be impairment. Andai kata berlaku sebaliknya. Your carrying value is lower than you punya market value. Then berlakulah impairment gain. Tapi jaranglah berlaku impairment gain. Selalunya impairment loss saja. Uh, okay. However, there are two distortion arise from asset impairment. Uh, ada isu lah. Okay, what are the issues that can happen in impairment? First, in term of conservative biases which distort the long-lived asset valuation because assets are written down but not written up. Nampak? Kebanyakan asset selalunya written down. Okay, selalunya lah. Kalau written up tu macam bangunan, buildings or land, then it can be written up. But other than that, normally all long-lived asset are written down. Next, next large transitory effects from recognizing asset impairment distort the net income. So, kalau berlaku terlalu besar sangat impairment losses, so it will affect the net income. Net income maksudnya net profit lah. Because you consider as expenses kan, impairment loss ni, you akan consider this sebagai expenses. So, you akan tolak daripada you punya uh, net profit. So, it will affect the net profit. Okay, next one in term of analysis of long-term asset. Okay, in term of capitalizing versus expensing. You can go to page 245 there. So, one of the key issues surrounding assets is when to expand a cost and when to capitalize a cost. Ini baru saya cakap tadi. Bila patutnya kita expand the cost or bila kita patutnya kita, kita capitalize the cost. So, first of all, kita tengok balik explanation or definition of expensing and capitalizing. Expensing involves charging the entire cost of an item to the current period statement which is into your statement of profit or loss. Semua perbelanjaan tersebut, kita klasifikasi dia sebagai perbelanjaan lah, expenses, tak kisahlah sama ada ada bawah uh, selling and distribution ke, under operation ke, atau even under finance cost. Okay, meaning to say you akan charge dia bawah expenses dalam SOPL. But for capitalizing, it involves recording the cost on the balance sheet as an asset and depreciating or amortizing the cost over time. Maksudnya, you can classify dia sebagai you punya asset, dan setiap tahun lepas tu, you akan depreciate mengikut useful life dia. Okay, so when you expand or you capitalize, it will give implication to the income, to the return on investment, to the solvency ratios and in fact to the operating cash flow of the business. So, dia mesti ada implikasi ataupun kesan dia terhadap keempat-empat yang saya cakap tadi. Okay, now let's look. So, the first one in term of uh, effect on the net income. Okay, kalau you tengok dekat page 245 tu kan, effects of capitalization on income. So, what will be the effect? Capitalization has two effects on income. First, it postpone recognition of expand in the income statement. This means capitalization yields higher income in the acquisition period but lower income in subsequent period as compared with expensing of course. Uh, now, bila you capitalize, so cost tersebut you akan masuk dalam asset. So, you takkan nampak perbelanjaan tu. Tapi bila dia dah mula digunakan, you akan nampak perbelanjaan tu wujud. Wujud dari segi mana? Wujud dari segi depreciation dia. However, kalau you expand, kalau you expand, dia akan jadi masalah. Kalau you tengok kat bawah tu kan, in contrast, allocating asset cost over benefit period yields and equal income number that is a more stable and meaningful measure of company performance. Meaning to say, kalau you expand, dia akan menyebabkan peningkatan dari segi perbelanjaan you, okay, dan kepenurunan dari segi you punya net income. Okay, itu beza dia lah. Because you dah charge semuanya. Katalah you buat renovation, 500,000. You charge semua tu bawa expenses. Apa akan jadikan daripada you punya net profit? Boom lah net profit you akan jatuh. Nampak tak? Because you charge semuanya dalam satu tahun. Okay, right. Next effect on return on investment. 
Capitalization decreases volatility in income measures and similarly return on investment ratio. It affects both the numerator and the denominator of the return on investment ratio. In contrast, expensing asset costs yields a lower investment base and increased income volatility. Volatility tu dia punya macam uh, sensitivity. Uh, okay, decreases the sensitivity in income. Maksudnya penurunan dari segi you punya uh, income uh, sensitivity lah. Kalau you classify as expenses, so dia akan meningkatkan the volatility of the income. Next, in term of the ratio, okay, ada immediate expensing of asset cost, solvency ratio such as debt to equity reflects more poorly on company that than warranted. This occur because the immediate expensing of cost under state equity for companies with productive asset. So, dia akan bagi kesan kepada you punya solvent, solvency because you punya net income dah jatuh. So, bagi kesan kepada you punya equity. Ah, macam tu kalau you buat expensing. Tapi kalau you capitalize, no. Capitalize, better ratio, higher asset and in fact better equity. Okay, next, cash flow pula. Apa effect kepada cash flow? So, when asset costs are immediately expense, they are reported as operating cash outflow. Ha, kalau you expand, terus kasi pasal sebagai operating cash flow. So, apa yang you akan nampak? You akan nampak nanti, you akan tengok you punya segment of cash flow, you nampak ada negative. Kan, negative cash flow from operating activities. That's why dia kata kat situ, dia kata apa? Lower since expand costs are reported as cash flow from operating activities. However, if you capitalize, it will be higher since capitalized costs are reported as investing cash outflow. So, dia tak akan bagi kesan kepada operating activities tetapi you akan nampak dia akan bagi kesan kepada investing. It's okay. Kalau investing tu negatif, tak ada masalah. Tapi kalau operating activity negatif, itu masalah. Investing activity memang akan selalunya negatif. Sebab apa? Bila you expand your business, purchase new machine, acquire new building, then dia akan bagi negative figure. Tapi kalau operating negatif, maksudnya produk you tak terjual. Ha, itu maksudnya. So, kesan dia berbeza. Alright, so that will be the effect. Dan ni pun selalu juga keluar dalam soalan final exam you. Okay, kita ada tengah sikit lagi. I akan habiskan terus. Will be the plant asset and the natural resources. So I believe you will touch this one in detail when you study your FATI 20. Kalau you go to your FATI 20, ada satu subjek berkaitan dengan natural resources ni. Kalau I tak silap, uh, MFRS 140 kot. 141 ke 142, I tak ingat lah. Ha, tapi berkaitan dengan ni, ha, livestock, natural resources ni kan. Ha, nanti you boleh tengok lah kat situ. Okay, now let's look at the definition down there, page 245. Okay, so plant asset and natural resources. So property, plant and equipment are non-current tangible asset used in the manufacturing, merchandising or service processes to generate revenues and cash flow for more than one period. Accordingly, this asset have expected useful life extending over more than one period. So, these assets are, in, uh, are intended for use in operating activities and are not acquired for sale in ordinary course of business. So, that will be the plant asset uh, ataupun property plant and equipment you. Okay, so this is how can you can value your PPE. Kan? You measure at the purchase price and all expenses needed, all expenditures needed to prepare the asset for its internet use. Okay, however, the acquisition cost will exclude any financing charges and cash discount. Okay, harga bah harga pod, uh, PPE tersebut, harga asset tersebut dengan cost untuk memasangnya, okay, untuk prepare dia macam mana, uh, benda tu semua sebahagian daripada you punya cost. Okay, so it will be acquired at the cost. Okay. Next will be natural resources. Valuing natural resources. You can go to page 246. So natural resources also called wasting asset. Okay, wasting assets are the rights to extract or consume natural resources. Examples are purchase rights to minerals. Bahan-bahan apa? Mineral kan? Bahan mineral tu macam arang batu, emas, apa lagi? Macam-macam uh, lagi lah. Kan? Timber natural gas and petroleum. Okay, so these are all example of natural resources. Companies report natural resources at historical cost plus cost of discovery, exploration and development. Also, there often are substantial costs subsequent to discovery of natural resources that are capitalized on the balance sheet. 
and uh, expense only when the resources is later removed, consumed or sold. So selalunya bila katakanlah syarikat oil and gas kan, contohnya macam Petronas, Petron and so on, dia nak cari sumber minyak yang baru. So apa dia buat, dia kena buat kajian. Kan, dia kena buat kajian, dia kena buat exploration and so on. Katakanlah dia jumpa dekat satu pakairan, dekat sekitar Pahang for example. So jumpa, oh kat sini ada sumber minyak yang baru. So kos nak pasang apa dia panggil tu, pelantar minyak lah, nak pasang dia punya drill gerudi tu. Oh, kos tu semua adalah sebahagian dia punya capitalization cost. So dia kena consider as asset. Masukkan sekali. Dia selalu dia kata kat situ. Okay. Companies report natural resources at historical cost plus cost of discover. Kan nak pergi selam, pakai kapal selam mini tu nak tengok kat mana. Explore. Nak buat exploration and development. Pembangunan perantai minyak and so on. So semua kos yang melibatkan uh, untuk mendapatkan bahan tersebut consider as cost of the asset. Okay, cuma dia akan expense bila dia dah start extract. Bila dah start sedut minyak tersebut and then baru later on dia expand. Mengikut jangka hayat dia lah. Oh katakanlah oh minyak ni ada ada boleh kita gali dan tempoh hayatnya lebih kurang dalam 20 tahun. For example, okay kandungan minyak dekat bawah tanah tu lebih kurang dalam 20 tahun. So setiap tahun dia akan deplete lah, depletion. Dia panggil depletion kan? Ha, okay, so dia akan depletion. Calculate dia punya depletion, depletion value dia and expense. So begitu. Okay. Okay. This one is in term of the uh, valuation model. Okay. Value. How how you how you value your PPE using the cost model and the fair value. Revaluation tu adalah fair value model lah. So this one you can read on your own. I tak ada masalah yang this one. Yeah, I think you dah belajar kan in term of fair value model ni. Okay, so kat sini I just bagi tahu in term of dia punya definition and the effects je lah. Senang saja kat sini. Okay, and in fact I also share with you the limitation of historical cost. Yeah, some of them dia kata apa? Statement of financial position do not purport to reflect market values. It is not especially relevant in assess replacement value and in fact it is not comparable across company and ada lagi a few limitation of historical cost. That is why the the the, the standard Okay, the Malaysian Accounting Standard Board, MSP, try to uh, recognize the fair value accounting to be implemented by the organization or the business registered in Malaysia. Okay. Now let's, go, let's look at the plant asset. Okay, plant asset. Okay, in terms of the depreciation. Depreciation is the process of allocating the cost of plant asset to expense in the accounting periods benefiting from its issue. So kalau macam uh, natural resources, you you using depletion. Kalau property plant equipment or plant asset, you using depreciation. So yang ini pun you tahu kan how to calculate your depreciation. You ada a few methods. Apa method dia? Yang pertama you ada straight line and then you have your reducing balance method. Ada sometimes organization they use some of digit method. Okay, it depends on the method that need to be adopt lah. Okay, so yang ni I pun tak nak cerita lebih because you dah tahu dah. Okay, uh, so these are the, the factors in computing the depreciation, the cost, the um, useful life, the depreciation method and so on. <coughs> okay, now let's go to this one, analyzing the depreciation and depletion. And how can you analyze them? Uh, this one you boleh tengok dekat page 253, page 253. Okay, how can you analyze? the depreciation and depletion method uh, adopt by the organization. First, by assess the reasonableness of depreciation base, useful life and allocation method. Tengok, adakah method yang digunakan tu sesuai? Adakah useful life yang di, di, dikatakan itu sesuai? Contohnya kan, you beli apa? You beli laptop ataupun you beli handphone. Handphone zaman dulu tak sama dengan handphone zaman sekarang. Handphone zaman dulu memang tak canggih. Handphone sekarang ni memang canggih gila lah. Tapi dia punya body dia tak kuat. Ha. I dulu punya handphone, but I pakai Nokia 2010, 3310. Oh, handphone tu jatuh daripada tingkat 1, tingkat 2 dekat college tu. Dekat college tu kan. Still boleh pakai lagi. Cuba handphone you tu. Jatuh daripada bilik you ke bawah tangga bawah je. Rumah you tu kan. Dah retak lah kot. Dah tak boleh pakai lagi lah. So in term of dia punya body dia tu tak solid. So now, useful life, dulu punya handphone maybe 5 years. Now punya handphone, maybe 2 to 3 years saja. 
Nampak tak? So, it it must be assessed the reasonableness tu. The useful life, useful life. Motor vehicle ke semua, you kena tengok. Sesuai ke motor vehicle letak sampai 50 tahun? Ha, ada company, dia pergi letak dia punya depreciation dia 50 tahun. Useful life untuk satu kereta biasa je, kereta sedan biasa. Itu pun kereta second hand. Logik ke? Dah lah beli kereta second hand tapi you kata, oh useful life kereta ni lagi 50 tahun. Tak logik lah. Ha, maybe about 5 years saja sebab dia second hand. Okay, so we must ensure the reasonableness of the depreciable base, useful life and the allocation method. And then review the useful life. Again, you kena review balik. Katakanlah you kata dulu kereta ni you beli untuk 7 tahun useful life dia. Selepas you kena 2 tahun dia tengok, oh kena review. Boleh ke lagi cepat lagi 5 tahun? Sebab baru tahun lepas kereta ni terlibat dengan kemalangan yang dahsyat. Sampai dia punya frame dia tu bengkok for example. Terpaksa kena ketuk major accident lah orang kata kan. Ha, kalau tengok pun maybe dah kena total loss tapi sebabkan sayang nak jual nak buang betulkan balik. Jadi bila betulkan balik useful life dia mungkin dah tak sama. So daripada baki lima tahun maybe tinggal dua atau tiga tahun sahaja lagi boleh pakai. So begitu. So you must review the useful life. Next apa lagi? Evaluate the adequacy of the depreciation in term of the ratio of the depreciation to total assets or to other size related factors and analyze the plant asset age. So kat sini dah bagi tahu how can you analyze your plant asset age. First, by calculating the total lifespan and then calculate the average age and then calculate the average remaining life and after that, baru you tahu berapa dia punya total lifespan. Okay, kat situ dia ada bagi calculation. I think this one you can go on by your own. Tak ada masalah. A simple calculation sahaja. Okay, now let's go to depletion. Okay, depletion is used to allocate the cost of extracting natural resources from the earth and is the actual physical depletion of a natural resource by a company. So, bila you extract petrol daripada bawah laut kan ataupun you gali arang batu daripada bukit-bukit ha, sekarang ni you ambil batu kapur lah, pasir and so on itu semua adalah depletion activities. Okay, now let's go to the last one which is your intangible asset. Okay, intangible asset in term of accounting for your intangible, analyzing your intangible and unrecorded intangible and contingency. Ni tu pun tak banyak lah, sikit aja. Yang penting yang kena-kena tahu adalah, okay, yang ni in term of definitions dia. Okay, the definition of the intangible asset, I think you can read uh, straight away from here. In term of the the definition, okay, intangible assets are the asset that without physical substance, useful life is often difficult to determine provide exclusive right or privileges and usually acquired for operational use. So these are the basic definition of intangible asset. You can read further in page 254, yeah? Okay, so what are the example of intangible assets? So as you can see, we have patents, copyright, leasehold, leasehold improvement, goodwill, trademarks and trade names. So these are example uh, of uh, intangible asset as you can see in the page 254 under exhibit 4.4, all right? Okay, so what you need to know is that intangible, especially you have two type of intangible. The first one is identifiable and the next one will be unidentifiable. So what are the differences between identifiable and unidentifiable ni? So the first one is identifiable intangible. Now let's go to the bottom page of 254 there. Eh? So identifiable intangibles are intangible assets that are separately identified and linked with specific rights or privileges having limited benefit periods. Candidates are patents, trademarks, copyright and franchises. So these are the example of identifiable intangible. So meaning to say you able to identify the rights and the privileges of the owners of this asset. Okay, companies record them at cost and amortize them over their benefit periods. So the writing off to expand of the entire cost of identifiable intangibles at acquisition is prohibited. Ah, oh, you tak boleh expand off cost the ni. You tak boleh tolak terus. You kena buat amortization. Untuk berapa lama dia digunakan? 5 tahun, 10 tahun, 15 tahun then amortize according to the useful life. Whereby for unidentifiable intangible pula. Okay, so these are assets that are either developed internally or purchased but are not identifiable and often possess indefinite benefit period. Example goodwill. Ada satu example saja. For example goodwill. So goodwill adalah unidentifiable intangible. Okay dia ada bagi uh, more explanation there. 
lepas goodwill tu and an example is goodwill when one company acquires another company or segment it needs to allocate the amount paid to all identifiable assets which includes identifiable intangible assets and liabilities according to their fair market value any excess remaining after this allocation is allocated to an unidentifiable intangible assets which are called goodwill so goodwill can be a sizable asset but it is recorded only upon purchase of another entity or segment meaning to say when you acquire another business kan you gabung dengan business yang lain you merge then akan wujudlah this goodwill okay which we will classify under unidentifiable intangible on how to measure how to recognize them i think i'm not the right person to give you the content you can refer to your far t20 lecturers lah i think they have a more information on that they are more uh, familiar with that uh, content i memang not the right person for for you to ask or how to calculate the goodwill and so on okay this is not my area all right okay this uh, the step on how can you analyze the intangible and goodwill okay for example search for unrecorded intangible and goodwill examine for super earnings review the amortization period and recognize a goodwill has a limited useful life okay in terms of the useful life or the goodwill all right so these are the analyzing parts okay in fact uh, you have another part which is the unrecorded intangibles and contingencies such as internally generated goodwill, franchises and licenses, research and development, and brand and trade name. So, yang ini tambahan sahajalah. You can read to sit away from page 256 tu. Uh, okay, sedikit sahaja kat situ just untuk kita punya knowledge sahaja. Okay, that's all for our chapter 4. Alright, so those pages yang I tak sentuh tu, you boleh abaikan. Don't worry. Okay, those pages yang agak banyak juga kan yang I tak I tak sentuh then you can skip lah. Okay, tengok mana yang I touch sahaja. Okay, right. So the rest of the content, memang kena baca textbook ni. You tak boleh depend solely on my slide sahaja. Alright, so you have any questions so far, class? Ada soalan nak tanya? Tak ada, sir. Soalan nak tanya? Tak ada. Okay, eh, hopefully you can understand even mungkin tak dapat semua, dapat sikit pun jadi tak ada masalah. It's okay. Alright, so lepas ni boleh baca balik, buat latihan and so on. So, uh, untuk soalan tutorial nanti I akan share lah. And in fact, you boleh tengok je dalam soalan pasir tu, pas exam question, tengoklah yang berkaitan dengan investing activities, then you can try to do it. Okay, if you want